thank you all for coming tonight. I think you're going to uh, see a great uh, conversation. Um, I look forward to it. I fully expect that, uh, as usual, the Ford Off Forum uh, crowd will uh, come up and ask some very uh, good questions, educated questions. Um, I just want to uh, talk through the format briefly of how we're going to proceed tonight and then introduce our speakers. <coughs> Uh, the format will be that we will allow each speaker up to 15 minutes to present uh, a point of view on the role of government, in, uh, particularly in light of the financial crisis. Um, and then I will uh, I'll moderate a discussion for a little bit. And then, as Jennifer said, uh, we, as always, would love to have the, the audience come up, ask questions, feel free to engage in a conversation, because that's what the Ford Hall Forum is all about. Uh, I do, I, I'm not sure if Jennifer mentioned it or not, but when you do come up to ask a question at the microphone, uh, please understand you're also assenting to being videotaped because as she mentioned, this will be on uh, online on our website on WGBH's uh, forum network, et cetera. Um, so, uh, and I do also ask that if you wanna come up and speak that um, we keep it civil, we keep it polite, uh, and we keep it quick and get to a question, please, because I think a lot of people will want to have a conversation here tonight. So let me uh, uh, thank both of the speakers. You know, these are two veterans of the Fort Hall Forum. Um, they've both uh, been involved in programs in the past. Uh, they both also happen to uh, uh, be involved with organizations that the Fort Hall Forum has a long history with. Uh, I was actually mentioning to uh, uh, Yaron Brook that uh, you know, I, I leafed through one of the recent biographies on Anne Rand, and uh, this was the forum that she only did in her later years. Uh, she'd come out every spring and only speak here. People would fly in from all over the country. Uh, it became to be known, at least according to one of those books, as the Enlightenment Easter, because it was every spring, and people would come to hear her speak uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, and the Boston Phoenix has also been a very uh, strong supporter of the forum. We've collaborated on a, a lot of programs. And uh, so I thank them both and, and the organizations they represent because we do have a long history with them. Uh, so let me introduce the speakers and we'll get right to it. Uh, first speaker will be uh, Peter Kadzis. Peter joined the Boston Phoenix as associate editor in 1988. He became the editor in 1989 and was named executive director of Phoenix Media communications group in 2004. He assumed responsibility for all content and operation at his three uh, newspapers, various magazines and websites. He's also a political commentator on Fox 25 News. Uh, he is the fair and balanced one, according to him. <laughs> Although Cosmo may disagree. Uh, Mr. Kadzis' newspaper career includes work at the Boston Globe, the Providence Journal, the New York Daily News, Money Magazine, and Forbes. He has covered a variety of topics, including breaking news, pl politics, Wall Street, and the economy. Mr. Kadzis also worked as an editorial advisor to the Boston Business Journal before founding its companion publication, the Providence Business News. Under Kadzis' leadership, the Phoenix has been awarded the Pulitzer for Criticism and the National Press Club's Arthur Rouse Award for Press Criticism. Kadzis, in 2002 and 2009, won the uh, NEPA's Award for Distinguished Editorial Writing. Dr. Yoram Brook serves as the executive director of the Anrand Institute and the Anrand Center, Center for Individual Rights, ARI's Washington, D.C.-based public policy arm. He's a prominent advocate for objectivism, the uh, philosophy of novelist Anrand. Dr. Brooke is a contributing editor to the Objective Standard, contributing author to the anthology Winning the Unwinnable War, and co-author of Neoconservatism, an Obituary for an Idea. He is a weekly guest on Front Page, hosted by PJTV, the first center-right online television network broadcasting over the internet, and makes frequent guest appearances on national radio and TV with Objectivism's unique perspective on current events. A popular speaker at universities, public forums, like the Fort Hall Forum, industry conferences, academic panels, community and professional groups, his recent talks encompass the moral foundations of capitalism and individual rights, including the right not to be your brother's healthcare keeper. So with that, I will turn the microphone over to Peter Kazas. Thanks for that <clears throat> splendid introduction. I actually feel like I might earn my weekly paycheck after hearing that. But um, let me launch right into this. And, and, and uh, please consider these more... Uh, a, a series of reflections. Uh, one of the things I've enjoyed in my years at the Forum is, uh, 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 despite how 
strongly held my opinions may seem, I come here always willing to have them uh, certainly modified. But um, our topic here today is, uh, I suppose, regulation, a word many people consider to be uh, a dirty one, a controversial one. Uh, well, I see it that our lives are awash in regulation. You know, we tell our children what time to go to bed. We all hopefully obey traffic lights. Uh, if we're male and 18 years of age, we register with the Selective Service for the uh, contingency that the draft might be reinstated. The food we eat is in many ways regulated. The air we breathe indirectly and rather less successfully is regulated. With the exception of family bedtimes, the regulations I detail here are all part of living in a complex society governed by the rule of law. These days, neither our complex society nor the rule of law is doing very well. Things are a mess. How we got to this sorry state is no simple tale at all. So let me carve out just a small piece of that story. Uh, we'll begin in 1978 when President Jimmy Carter followed the advice of a Cornell economist, Alfred Kahn, and deregulated the airline industry. Um, for 30 years, the idea that government should leave business, industry, and Wall Street alone grew in popularity. It was truly bipartisan supported to varying degrees uh, and increasing degrees from Carter to Reagan, from Bush number one to Bill Clinton, and that found perhaps its purest expression in the administration of uh, George W. Bush. The White House liked deregulation, so did most members of Congress, and generally speaking, the courts looked favorably upon it. For at least 12 of those years, Clinton's eight and George W. Bush's first four, the Washington consensus was that the less regulation of business, especially the financial services industries, the better off the nation would be. Then came 9-12, September 12th, 1980, and the collapse of Lehman Brothers, and the official start of the worst financial crisis of our lifetime. I say official because the crisis had actually begun much before that. Anyway, this crisis of a lifetime, by the way, isn't over yet, but I'll touch on that a bit later. The economic collapse, the severe dislocation that followed, is a pretty painful story that's well known to all of us. Its cause was policy-oriented. The Federal Reserve kept interest rates low in order to keep bond rates low to ease the funding for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Those wars are the first in our history to be fought without an increase in taxes to pay for them. A pleasurable side effect of this, and my use of the word pleasurable is coded with a bitter irony, was the housing bubble, which eventually burst. It was less the whole bubble and more a facet of it, the subprime segment, uh, what Wall Street called ninja mortgages, no income, no jobs, no questions asked, that was the locus of this catastrophe. Not only was this segment of the market underregulated, the subprime ninjas were aggressively collateralized and sold worldwide by the, worldwide by the well-tailored snake oil salesmen we all call investment bankers. Ostensibly, to protect or hedge these new investment vehicles, and to make even more money in the process, a new form of der derivative, credit default swaps, were invented. The problem was, still in my eyes, that very few really understood how these work. Efforts to regulate the derivative markets were killed by the Clinton administration. Um, in my mind, uh, uh, a public enemy who has escaped a lot of blame in what has followed. Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, together with Larry Summers and Fed Chief Alan Greenspan, ganged up on a woman named Brooksley Bourne, who headed the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, and they squashed her plans to regulate credit default swaps. So it was bad policy that is at the root of the economic collapse that we're st still struggling to get out from under, and it was a lack of regulation that made that problem even worse. 
While these were the root causes of the economic devastation that washed over the world, they were not very easy to reduce to the sort of black and white story we in the media like to tell. So let's consider the Madoff scandal, in which a crook named Bernie ran a classic Ponzi scheme for many, many years under the eyes of the Securities and Exchange Commission. You know, as Bostonians, we should take sort of a perverse pride. The Ponzi scheme was invented here in Boston, as was the safety deposit box. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, listen, it is impossible to legislate against human folly. But failure on such a grand scale as Madoff certainly is one for the books. You know, this was, you know, this was a case, Madoff was a case of lax registration, stupid regulation. It was regulation so inept as to be as criminal as the very behavior it allowed to prosper. But I suggest, however, that the overall climate of opinion, which had taken root in Washington, indeed throughout most of the nation, that business was best regulated by being left alone, played a major role in that multi-billion dollar crime. It certainly played a role in the catastrophe at, upper, at the Upper Big Branch Mine in Mount Cole, West Virginia, which killed 25 miners. I think it played a role in the explosion in the Gulf of Mexico that killed 11 oil workers, in the subsequent leak that is fouling the Gulf of Mexico and threatening the Florida Keys. And to return to Wall Street, it played a role in allowing Goldman Sachs to help Greece swindle the, Amer the European Union. That's a complicated tale, too, and here's more or less how it went down. Goldman Sachs helped the Greek government to mask the true extent of its deficit with the help of a derivatives deal that legally, legally circumvented the European Union's deficit rules. At some point, the so-called cross-currency swaps, that was the vehicle they used, will mature, and they'll swell the country's already bloated deficit. This is admittedly complicated and probably outside what we're going to be getting into. It's the sort of pro uh, problem that really needs to be addressed by international treaty, I think. But I think it's, at worst, it's worth bringing up. The Greek credit debacle and the threat of similar crises in maybe Italy, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, could do what 912, the Lehman collapse, failed to do, plunge the world into a deep and lasting economic depression as grave or even graver than the one of the 1930s. Obviously, the economic consequences of this are dire and the political implications are even more frightening. Let's not forget that the economic dislocations of the 30s led to the rise of Mussolini and the coming to power of Hitler. These two fascists working hand in glove with Stalin and the military nationalists of Japan unleashed the Second World War. That in turn birthed communist China, which within our lifetime may well be the world's mightiest economy. Now, you might think that this heavyset cat with a beard up at the podium spins a good yarn and ask yourself, what's this have to do with the way I live my life today? What's it have to do with the way I'm going to live my life tomorrow? Well, here's my answer. What we call Wall Street has, for a variety of reasons, some good, some bad, become almost as powerful as a nation state. To allow it to conduct its business unregulated, unpoliced, is to invite disaster. Here we sit after the greatest economic expansion in history, and what do we have to show for it? A mountain of personal, corporate, and government debt. And if that debt keeps growing at its current rate, it will, according to the International Monetary Fund, bankrupt the United States in about seven years. A mindset that believed that manufacturing useful things for purchase around the world was a quaint notion best left to less developed countries also sprung up during this time. No, America said, we'll stake our future on the service economy. We all seem to have forgotten what Mark Twain once quipped, that nobody ever got rich 
taking in somebody else's laundry. To me, re-regulating Wall Street is not the only answer to all of our problems, but it is part of an answer. If you doubt that, just ask, I just ask you to remember 912, a date that history will record as being far more significant than 911. Thank you. Well, let me start where I agree with Peter. Um, <laughs> and that is that clearly we're at a point in history where the choices we make in the years to come uh, have huge implications. Um, there is a real possibility of that in our lifetime we will live through a depression worse than the 1930s. Uh, and then we will see the consequences, similar to what happened in the 1930s, of the rise of, of dictatorships, of you know, the world as we know it ending. <laughs> I think that is a real possibility. And, and the debt that Peter talked about is, I think, the prime, the, uh, the financial cause of all that, unless something is done. But when it comes to explaining this financial crisis, how we got here, and what do we need to do in order to avoid this nasty scenario that, that we agree on, we obviously, um, we obviously disagree. Um, what we faced in the last three years is a debt crisis. It's a debt crisis, uh, and, and what I see it manifesting today is, in a sense, we've got a rolling debt crisis. It started with housing, it's, but we're, we're, it's, we're discovering that this debt is held everywhere throughout our economy, both domestically and internationally. We are over leveraged. We have too much debt. We cannot afford to pay back that debt. And the question that needs to be asked is, how do we get into this kind of situation? How did we get ourselves into this mess? Um, and I think to, to see this, and, and we could go back to, to 1978, we could go back because a lot of the roots of, I think, the problems we have today from an economic perspective, you would have to go back uh, to the Great Depression and the policies of FDR, who I think begins it all. But that would take us a long time to, 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 to start back then and to roll this forward. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to start with more modern history, and that is the Fed's response uh, to 9-11. And while we agree that the Fed lowered interest rates are far too low, uh, we disagree on the cause. I, I don't believe that the primary motivation was to fund the Iraq war. Um, I think the primary motivation was to avoid a recession. And this has been a policy of the Federal Reserve, uh, at least since Greenspan has been there, that recessions are bad things. We don't like recessions. People lose their jobs. The economy has to be structured. There's pain in recessions, and we don't want pain. You know, be happy. You know, enjoy life. Go buy stuff in the mall. Don't worry. Just don't worry. Be happy has been the economic slogan of the last 25 years. And in order to avoid a recession coming out of the dot-com collapse and coming out of 9-11, Alan Greenspan in 2002 lowered interest rates to 1%, at the time the lowest rate they'd ever been, kept them below the rate of inflation for two and a half years. In finance, we call that negative real rates of return. Basically, when you have negative real rates of return, the borrower is basically paying you to borrow money. When rates are that low, we all borrow money. It just makes sense to borrow money. You know, at 1%, there's a lot of things I can do with that money. It does, it's not costing me almost anything. And we all borrowed money. We borrowed on our homes. We borrowed on our credit cards. Governments borrowed money. Corporations borrowed money. Everybody borrowed money. And at some point, when we had to pay for all that borrowing, we couldn't. But the source of that is Federal Reserve policies. It's setting interest rates at a ridiculously low rate and thus incentivizing everybody in the economy to borrow money. And I believe that is the ultimate root cause of the housing bubble. We borrowed money to buy a home, and then the home went up in value so we could sell it and borrow more money to buy even a more expensive home. And more people entered the market who could borrow money now for the first time. And you know, that's how you get bubbles. You get lots of money flowing around into everybody's hands 
and people go out on buying sprees and prices go up when people buy stuff. Now, why did it happen? Why did this low interest rates manifest itself primarily in a housing bubble? Well, here you get into the second part of what I think is at the root of this uh, crisis, and that is American U.S. housing policy. Again, since the 1930s, uh, which, is, uh, which is the beginning of a lot of bad things. But since the 1930s, the United States has had housing policy. We don't have a free market in housing. We don't let the markets determine you know, who should live in what house, what kind of mortgages should be out there. You know? We don't let the market clear. We don't have supply and demand. We have a whole regulatory and government structure devoted to getting people into homes. After all, it's part of the American dream, and it's the role of government, we are told, to make that dream come true. And therefore, government has been engaged in trying to make that dream come, come true, and they did it in a pretty conservative level, in a pretty conservative way for many years, so they didn't really get into trouble, although you know, I, I would argue in a, you know, maybe in the Q&A that the SNL crisis is related directly to this issue, to housing policy and, what ha and how SNLs were set up. So, but that's a crisis we don't associate with this crisis. But it was basically caused by very similar things, bad Fed policy and bad housing policy. But as long as it didn't get too bad, uh, you know, nothing happened. But starting in the 1990s, there was a real push, particularly for low-income individuals, to get people into homes, um, the mandates for Freddie and Fannie to government entities uh, that you know, pretended to be private but really were government entities. Uh, there was a push to get these two entities to lend more money for homes uh, and uh, to low-income people and to lower the standards for mortgages. And it wasn't just Freddie and Fannie. There's, there's multiple entities that the government engages in. So when money became cheap, in the early 2000s, when money became really, really cheap, it all flowed into housing to a large extent funneled there through a variety of government policies and a variety of government incentives uh, that you know, made the bubble happen in housing versus anywhere else. And, and of course, it doesn't end there because the, one, the, one of the characteristics of this crisis is it is complex. There are a lot of derivatives and a lot of interesting and complicated stuff going on. But when you start peeling the layers off, you always find government somewhere down there. So the Fed is a government entity. Housing policy is government housing policy. And you can, you know, we can go in any direction we want here and we will find bad government regulations or the very existence of government regulations distorting markets and leading us to this point. For example, why did banks behave so stupidly? Why did they behave so irresponsibly? Why did the big banks do some of the lending that they did? Well, how did they get their money, these banks, to do these silly things? They borrowed it. Now, why did people lend the money when the banks were behaving stupidly? Well, because they weren't worried. They knew they would be bailed out. There's been a doctrine in the United States, at least since the early 80s, called too big to fail. And the big banks all knew that they were too big to fail, and they behaved. If I tell you, you get all the upside on deals, and you don't really suffer on the downside if you, know, if you go bankrupt, you take on a lot of risk, because you get the benefit when the risk pays off, and when it doesn't, you just walk away. Too big to fail is a government policy. It's not a market policy. There's no such thing as too big to fail in the marketplace. Uh, you could go on and on. Credit agencies. You know, why did credit agencies give AAA ratings to junk, literally to junk, that was created out there. Well, I mean, there are only three credit agencies. These are the three credit agencies that when Orange County, the county I live in, went bankrupt in 1994, had Orange County rated a AAA, the best rating, just weeks before it went bankrupt. When Enron went bankrupt, they had it rated AAA just before it went bankrupt. In a marketplace, when you are so incompetent, what happens to you? You get competed out of existence. Why? Doesn't that happen to the credit agencies in the United States? Because there are only three approved by the SEC. You can't compete with them. You can't. You start a credit agency, do better than them, nobody, it doesn't matter. The buyers of debt have to use the ratings of these three credit agencies. Government involvement, again, in a marketplace wouldn't exist. And again, you could keep doing this with every one of these and find government at the bottom. 
Regulations, when this crisis began in the financial industry, were massive. I, I think it's a complete mythology that the Bush era was an era of deregulation. Quite the contrary. If you speak to bankers, particularly at the larger banks, and you ask them, uh, when was, the, what, was regulation less during the Bush era than it was beforehand? They would all say no. They longed for Clinton. They all longed for the Clinton era. Regulations were far lower under Clinton. Regulators were far more emboldened under Bush. And I have a theory that Republicans generally uh, give instructions to their regulatory agencies to be more vigilant in many cases to prove that they're not softies. They're not really pro-free markets like their enemies portray them as. Um, so the Bush era was an era of regulation. Indeed, the most massive new regulation, at least since the 60s, if not since the 30s, was passed under Bush, which was Sarbanes-Oxley, which, again, you can ask me about and cost this economy trillions of dollars. Uh, so the Bush era was an era of increased regulations, not decreased regulations. Anybody remember Spitzer? Remember Spitzer? N not for the other stuff, for the financial stuff. <laughs> That's regulation. Spitzer went after Wall Street with a vengeance in the early 2000s. So the idea that Wall Street was somehow this haven of freedom, of free markets, of no government intervention is bizarre. And not only did Spitzer go after them, I would argue he destroyed their business model and forced them to become the equivalent of hedge funds, which I think they were later in the decade. We can talk about derivatives, credit default swaps. I'd be happy to talk about those if you want to bring them up in the, uh, in the, um, the Q&A. Let me just say one word about, uh, a few words about Madoff. Yeah, what a failure of regulation. And why is it a failure of regulation? You know, the one thing the SEC should do, in my view, is catch crooks. <laughs> and the one thing they can't do is catch crooks. And why? Because they're too busy. They're too busy with a million little regulations that they have to follow. They have to check up on my 13 Ds. Because every time I buy more than 5% of a stock of a public company, I have to let the world know. And then if it's 10%, I have to let them know why I own 10%, you know, and what my intentions are. And there are a million little forms like this that the SEC has to get. There's no fraud here. There's no reason I should let the world know that I own more than 5%. Before I had to let the world know I own 5%, before that regulation was passed, the financial markets worked fine in the United States. So the SEC, as most bureaucrats and most regulators, are so busy doing the little, the little stuff the massive number of the thousands and thousands of pages of regulations. Who has time to catch crooks? <laughs> Who has time to catch Bernie Madoff? Nobody has time to catch Bernie Madoff. And this goes, this goes to this idea of regulations. Regulations are not telling your kids to go to bed at night. And, and we can talk about what parents and kids, their relationships. Regulations about the government using force and intervening in voluntary transactions between consenting adults in the marketplace. That's what regulations do. Regulations is about the government bringing its force, bringing a gun into transactions between adults, contractual transactions between adults in the business world. And that is not the role of government. The role of government is to protect us from Bernie Madoff. The role of government is to protect us from people who would use force and fraud to harm us. The rest should be left alone to market. And if we're looking for solutions, this crisis was caused by too much government. This crisis was caused by too much government at the Federal Reserve level, by too much government in housing policy, by too much government in regulating every aspect of the financial industry. The solution to this crisis is to start systematically rolling back government. Ultimately, in the long term, rolling it back so far that there's not no, you know, that we even do away with the Federal Reserve. There's no reason banking and money cannot be privatized. We had that before. We established the Federal Reserve uh, and with more stability than we've gotten since the establishment of the Federal Reserve. Rolling back Housing policy, there should be no housing policy. You want to buy, you want to rent, should be up to you. 
rolling back financial regulations. And it's true. Wall Street has become really, really powerful, politically powerful. But whose fault is that? When you regulate an industry, what incentive do you give that industry? You give that industry an incentive to turn around and lobby and try to grab control the people who are regulating it. That's not capitalism. That's not freedom. That's a perversion. The way you get rid of that is not by increasing regulation, thus increasing the incentive to control the regulator. You do it by eliminating the regulations. And when you eliminate the regulations, Wall Street now has to function by the rules of the marketplace, not by the rules of, of politics, not by the rules of, of, of influence. But just let Wall Street compete. Let the banks, let Goldman compete with the other financial institutions. So the long-term solution to this financial crisis is freedom. The long-term solution to this crisis is the recognition of the proper role of government, is the recognition that the government in this country was established to protect our rights, our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what that means is that the government in this country was established in order to allow us to live our lives as we see fit without people telling us, forcing us, to do the things we do not want to do. And as the Founding Fathers understood, the, greater vi the greatest violator of individual rights is government. And what we need today is protection against our government. And the only way to do that is to start rolling that rolling the role of government back from our lives, from all aspects of our lives, and a recognition and a recommitment to the true role of government uh, as the protector of our rights, protector of our freedoms. Leave us alone. We, we can handle credit default swaps fine. It's when the government get a hold of them, that's when I really worry about them. Thank you all. So, <laughs> two very different opinions. Um, you know, from, I, I'm going to try to simplify this as best as I can. I guess, um, Peter, from what I hear from you is uh, it was a lack of regulation. And you're on what I hear from you. It, was, it wasn't lack of regulation. It was bad regulation. Mm -mm. It was regulation, period. I would say okay. that it, it's... No, the, uh, uh, it was um, an absence of a certain sort of regulation. Um, the, the, the market had changed so much um, in the course of 30 years that they were uh, regulating, as John points out, minutely and often very foolishly, things that didn't matter anymore. Um, For example, uh, paperwork. I see. Um, let me sort of put on the table my my. I generally don't like the idea of regulation. I sort of accept it as a necessary evil. Um, in terms of businesses in general, um, the financial sector has become so complicated and so large that I find it hard to see how the economy can really f function without some form of regulation, almost in the form of consumer uh, protection. In, in, in my view of the world, I think the farther away you get from Wall Street, the less regulation there should be. Um, I, I suspect that you know, out, out in the periphery, we'd probably agree the closer we get to Wall Street, the, the closer we're going to disagree. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of what's took, a lot of what took place in Wall Street, uh, the whole variety of derivatives, um, they were brand new things invented. Um, uh, to serve some very interesting purposes. Um, uh, 
but they became, I can't think of a better way of phrasing this, they became almost a shadow economy in and of themselves. I don't mean shadow as in, you know, um, while they, they were certainly mysterious to most of us, um, they were not intended initially as sinister vehicles. Um, uh, that's what I think needs to be regulated today. Um, these are very complicated, and frankly, I, I, I think a, a simple solution would be just to, to buy their use altogether, but that's just not, a, that, that's just not practical in, in, in the international economy. Um, it, it is very complicated. There was one thing Jan said that I found very interesting, um, in, in that I certainly uh, agree with, and that America has had this bizarre fascination with trying to um, shape the housing market. And it has been the cause of an awful lot of problem. It goes back at least to Herbert Hoover, who we all think of as a very conservative president. Actually, Herbert Hoover was considered, you know, a hardcore progressive back in those days. Absolutely. And again, we don't have to <laughs> dive into the history of all this, but, um, Chasing the American dream of home ownership for everyone has cost this nation and probably more than it's contributed uh, over the years. But anyway, I'm, I'm sort of... Oh, no, no, that's this. fine. I'm going to just ask you... Go ahead. Do you want to... Yeah, uh, let me... A, f a few things. You know, Freddie and Fannie, uh, f f these were the uh, government-sponsored entities. They were, you know, their debt was basically guaranteed by the government. And, and here, were, here were entities that did something... It was pretty simple. It wasn't that complicated, right? They, they, they bought mortgages from banks, they put them into packages, and they sold them off. Relatively simple. Each one of them, Freddie and Fannie, each had its own regulatory agencies responsible just for regulating them, nothing else, right? So there was a regulatory agency responsible for Freddie and a regulatory industry for Fannie. Um, hundreds of regulators. And yet, no failure, not Lehman, not Citibank, not AIG, comes close, close to the failure that is Freddie and Fannie. They are clearly the most bankrupt, most bankrupt in a sense, mm -hmm. they losses are larger than anybody else. And they did something relatively simple. I mean, I would argue that the more complex anything is, the further away you want the regulators from it as possible. They have no clue, and, and this, they have no clue what would be going on there. They're incompetent, and, and there's a reason they're incompetent. It's not, you know, if they, if they many of them, uh, if they were really smart, would be working for the investment banks. And indeed, what happens to regulators, if, if, you look at the, if you look at the history, is that the better ones work at the regulatory agency for a while, and they cozy up to the, the banks, and because when they leave the regulatory agency, they work for the banks. Uh, and, and you can see this rotating door effect all the time. I mean, it's, it's, there is no way to do this even if you thought it was a good thing to do. There's no way to effectively regulate Wall Street. The only way you can regulate Wall Street is exactly Peter's uh, uh, comment, that shut it down, shut it down. Shutting it down would have devastating economic consequences to the economy. We can talk about derivatives. I don't think they're that complicated, um, but then I'm a finance PhD. But uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think they serve a vital uh, you know, a vital purpose in our economy. Uh, I think they are a worthwhile product. I don't think this problem really has anything to do with derivatives. Uh, the derivative market did not fail, and uh, you know, if the bailouts would have happened, the world would have not, if the bailouts had not happened, the world would have not come to an end. Uh, the, the, the reason the world came close to coming to an end, in my view, is, is the Washington panicked, and, and the Federal Reserve panicked, and when they panic, they're supposed to be the guys who know what they're doing, Everybody else panicked, and they panicked on that weekend of 9-12. It was a key weekend because they let Lehman fail, and they wouldn't let AIG fail, and they had bailed out Bear Stearns a few, a few months earlier, and nobody knew <clears throat> what the hell anybody was doing. It was complete chaos. Uh, and in a regulated world, in a regulated world, what the Treasury Secretary and the Federal Reserve Chairman do is really, really important because they're controlling everybody on a string. All these, invest all these bankers are being controlled on a string. So... What really happened there is that the people in charge panicked. And that's one of the reasons, one of many reasons, why we don't want people in charge. 
In a free market, bankers make mistakes. They do. They do really stupid things. And they pay the consequences for that. And the people who lent the money pay the consequences for that. And their investors pay the consequences for that. And they go out of business. That's how a market works. Systemic risk, all this stuff about everything, that can only exist and does indeed only exist in a regulated market in which the real systemic risk operator here is the Federal Reserve that ties everybody together and winds them all up. And you know, the real systemic risk is when Paulson is panicking. The real systemic risk is when Bernanke doesn't know what he's doing because they have an impact on everything, not on anything particular. And <coughs> this is one reason, I don't think the most important reason, why government should not be involved in economics. It's, they just, you know, Frederick Hayek and, and, and many of the Austrian thinkers have, have expressed this quite well. They're just not, it's just impossible to do. The economic calculation that is necessary to do this stuff is impossible to do, and therefore the best thing is to get them out of there. I think there's a much deeper and more important moral argument why they shouldn't be involved, but there's certainly a valid economic argument that it just can never work. So, Peter, I, I just want to ask you, I'm going to ask you each a quick question, and then if people want to start lining up in a few minutes um, over here again, uh, and, and we'll take you one at a time. But Peter, I, you happen to have the unfortunate uh, uh, circumstance to sit next to somebody who works for a heavily regulated industry, very heavily regulated industry. And I can tell you that um, what I see on a daily basis uh, what a you know a pharmaceutical company in this case has to go through in terms of regulatory um, responses, um, how you co conduct yourselves, it is extremely protected already. Uh, and to be honest, a, a lot of days, I'm, you know, I'm I'm worried about more regulations on this industry. And, and to some extent, it's like when do you, when do you do your job? So, mm -hmm. in some of these industries, uh, it's not just the pharmaceutical. Um, but you know, in some industries, it seems as though we are getting to a point where regulation is so complex that nobody knows what they're doing, not just the regulators, nobody knows what they're doing at the companies sometimes. And, and sometimes you play by the rules that change before you know it. So, so can it be possible to be overregulated? Isn't there at some oh, point we say, I, I, listen, I, you know, I, 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 I think it definitely can. Listen, in my little mini history of how we got to be where we are, I, I cite the deregulation of the um, airline industry. Wasn't perfect, but I think it was a good move. I, I mean, um, the, 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 the trend toward deregulation was not in and of itself a bad thing. Um, I mean, I have friends in other industries. I have lawyers who, <laughs> friends who are lawyers <laughs> who just sort of chuckle about how much money they make, you know, helping these poor bastards who are their clients trying to, you know, keep keep track of this. Listen, mine is not a def my position is not a defense of regulation per se. Um, do I think, you know, drug companies like food companies need a degree of regulation? Yes, I do. I'll be honest with you. I'm not expert enough to know to what degree, and if, if you were to suggest to me that there's too much, you know what, I would probably agree with you. Um, uh, but it seems sometimes the answer is when, when a problem comes up that more regulation is, you know, an instinctive answer, perhaps these days more so. Well, and, uh, and, and, you know, I we, we, that, we, that we, leads we, to more problems. Listen, a lot of these problems have to do with human nature. Um, it, 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 take a non-economic problem, school bullying, you know, which there's been big headlines here in Massachusetts. We're going to stamp out bullying with, you know, new government reform. Little story. My son, the fifth, fifth grader, um, was the victim of being bullied. Um, we go to the school, as parents have for a gazillion years. Uh, we were concerned because he was really hurt. Um, we talked to the principal. We talked to the teacher. We were convinced everyone had everything under control. It just happened to be the day that bullying was on the front page of the Globe. And I said, you know, this bullying legislation sounds like a bunch of baloney to me. The principal, the teacher agreed. They said, this isn't going to help us do anything. You know, we... You know, it's not just that we're risk averse or that conversely we should go out and embrace risk. Um, we think we can cure every problem that exists, and I don't believe we can. Problems are part of life. 
Um, and and I, I do think there's a worldview that's far removed. Listen, I'll tell you, I think one reason why Wall Street needs more regulation than it, than it might have years before is because I think the general standards of honesty and morality are lower than what they once were. You know, take a person who today is considered a great, you know, a swashbuckler, J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan built his banking empire on being more honest than the other investment bankers. Um, you know, today you have J.P. Morgan's market equivalent, Goldman Sachs, in effect, colluding to, I would say, defraud. It's, I don't mean it, it, not defrauding in a legal sense, because frankly, none of the conduct that's taken place on Wall Street, or, or I should say, very little of the conduct that's taken place on Wall Street during these years has been illegal. I think it's been detrimental, but it hasn't been illegal. Um, as old-fashioned as it sounds, I do think that there, um, a, a decline in generally accepted standards of honesty is, is, is part of the problem here. So I, to some extent, I, I talk about my own personal experience of overregulation, but I do see the need for regulation, and perhaps even you know, upholding laws is regulation, too. I mean, there's regulations to convict the Bernie Madoffs of the world. So we, you know, we do have to find them and hold them to some standards. So um, I guess my question, <laughs> does, doesn't regulations provide some stability? I mean, isn't it good to know the rules of what you're playing? I mean, is it the change of regulations or is it, is it the existence really? Because I think to some extent stability of regulations is just knowing the rules of the game. You, know, you don't play a baseball game and change the rules in the seventh inning. That's that's ridiculous. So wouldn't that be more helpful than not having or, or having a lot less regulation? No, I mean the you know every fascist dictatorship has lots of stable <laughs> regulation. I, I don't think that's the issue. Although you know they're not implemented in a stable way, but but they're, they're on the books in a stable way. No, I mean let's let's ask the bigger question: Why do we have regulations to begin with? So you know, I took an elevator up uh, up four stories, and at the corner of every elevator in in the entire country, there's a little certificate that says that some bureaucrat has checked this elevator and it's okay for you to ride it. <laughs> and 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 this is a question: Why is it that we believe we need some bureaucrat to approve the elevator? Right? I mean. If you think about it, put on your business hat. I, I used to tell, I, when I do business seminars, I always tell my, you know, the, the attendees, I say, you know, you all know that the best way to make money in the elevator business is to build defective elevators and to kill people on a periodic basis, right? <laughs> and they all look at me like I'm nuts because no real businessman, every real businessman knows that that's not how you make money. So why do we have them? Uh, why do we have uh, elevator inspectors and food inspectors and, and drug inspectors? And why don't we trust the market to deal with these? And there are ways, every one of these situations, there's a way in which the market has shown, and I could show you if the market hasn't existed, how the market would deal with it in a much more satisfying way, I think, than, than paying some uh, government official to come and do it. And I think it has to do, and this is, it has to do with, with the, the morality the ethics that we as a culture hold, uh, uh, hold dear. So what is it that business is about, that, that markets are about? Well, what is it that the guy who's building the elevator is about? Well, they're about profit, right? They're about making money. They're about making money for whom? Well, for themselves. So they're about being self-interested. They're about pursuing their own self-interest. And it's not all money. I know somebody will say, I'm in business. I don't just do it for the money. True. You do it for the passion, and you do it for the you know, love of creating beautiful products like the iPhone, that, uh, you know, and so on. So, but it's all about you. Business and markets about you. And when you go shopping and you go to the mall, you're going to stimulate the economy, right? That's why you buy stuff. <laughs> you go, it's also about you. It's about self-interest. It's about pursuing your own self-interest, satisfying yourself, right? What do we know about self-interest? Well, we've been taught since we're this little that self-interest is a bad thing because we've been led to believe that pursuing one's self-interest is the same as lying, stealing, cheating, backstabbing, doing whatever it takes. That's what we've been taught. Now, I don't believe that's true, and I think if you think about it for a little while, you'll see that it's not really true. 
that pursuing one's own real long-term self-interest is not. And just look at Bernie Madoff's life, and you can see it. Yes, he got a lot of money, but what a miserable human being he was. Um, that really, if you understand self-interest and what it means to live a full life as a human being, all those things are not true. But we're mixing the two. So automatic our assumption is, when we think about the guy building the elevators, uh-oh, he's going to cut quarters. He's going to lie, steal, and cheat in order to, even though that doesn't really happen, and when it does happen, it's very rare, and if it did happen, he'd go to jail because he committed fraud or he, he got a business because he built a bad product. But we don't even go there, right? We automatically assume he's a crook. And this is, when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed, when Enron happened, when Enron happened, what did the country say to itself? The country said to itself, they didn't say, this is what they didn't say, cool, we caught a bunch of crooks, let's put them in jail, good. What they said was, you know, all these CEOs are suspect. Every single one of them is probably a crook. We caught a few, but though, I mean, they were all probably crooks. I was on Bill O'Reilly's show right after, during that period. Now, Bill O'Reilly is, is a very good populist. He's, he's very good at sensing the mood of the people and reflecting that back. And Bill, and, and it, I was on the show where he announced that he believed that every CEO in America should be fired because they're all crooks. <laughs> and I think that was the mood of the country. And what did we get as a consequence? Sarbanes-Oxley, which treats every CEO in America as a crook until proven otherwise. That's the whole basis for the legislation. Passed, by the way, 97 to zero in the Senate, for those of you who believe conservatives are pro-business. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the reason, the underlying reason is that we believe this about self-interest. And I think until we change that, until we understand that self-interest is not about lying, stealing, and cheating, and that profit is a good thing, and people pursuing their passions and going to the mall to buy stuff that's looks nice on them, that, that, that they're passionate about is a good thing. Until we have a respect and an admiration for self-interest. Until we say, not that Bill Gates was an eh, okay guy when he made 30 gazillion dollars, but he's a really good guy when he's giving it away. When we start admiring people for making the money, for making the most out of their own lives, for living their lives to the most that they can be. Until we do that, we're always going to want to regulate. Now, what is, is it that we trust about a regulator? And this reminds you of J.P. Morgan. Because I believe that the Federal Reserve was established in order to stop J.P. Morgan. It, it come, comes right after the hearings where J.P. Morgan is brought in front of Congress and humiliated because he was too powerful. Now, what don't we like about J.P. Morgan being powerful? That he's in it for the profit, right? All, everything he does, he's, he was completely honest and he, he was all about character. And he did it for the money. He was trying to make money. He was trying to make money for himself and his company. We took that power away from J.P. Morgan, gave it to the chairman of the Federal Reserve, more power than J.P. Morgan ever, ever, ever had. The chairman of the Federal Reserve, if from an economic sense, is probably the most powerful man on the planet. Right? Alan Greenspan certainly believed he was, and I think he was. Why do we trust Alan Greenspan but don't trust J.P. Morgan? Because Alan Greenspan is a public servant. He's not in it for himself. He's trying to maximize social utility and make us all better off. And we trust people like that because of what we've learned about ethics when we were little kids. And I say that's wrong. I don't trust public servants. I really don't. When people tell me they're trying to do good for me, I run as fast as I can. <laughs> I, I trust people who want to trade with me, who, who want to help me buy trading with me. They want to sell me an iPhone, but for money, not for free. And I think those human relationships are much healthier. The profit-seeking human relationships are far more healthy than the public servant, do-good, public interest type people and type relationships. And, you know, and that's why when government intervenes, it fails. It fails in the drug business. It fails in the banking business. And we can talk about regulations far away from Wall Street and how disastrous they are. The, the, every aspect of our lives today is coming under some, some form of regulations because somebody in Washington doesn't trust a market, you know, that sense of trade, that self-interest that is involved in the market transactions. I'm going to give Peter a minute. And then, again, if people want to start asking questions, please start lining up over here. Um, there's a lot squirreled away in what was just said that I agree with, but let me point to a couple of examples. Again, I think a noticeable one is 
in the Gulf of Mexico. You know, is it in the interest of an oil company, you know, to wreak ecological havoc? No, it isn't. Could it have been present, prevented? This time it could have with the use of a certain valve. I think that's a, a perfect example of of an instance where regulation, where a, a simple regulation would have made a difference. The same with the mine. Um, uh, the, 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 the problem, or maybe perhaps not the problem, the tension between our worldviews is that, um, I, for better or for worse, I think I'm willing to accept, or not willing, I unfortunately accept the world for what it is. Um, not a very pleasant place. And I, I don't think whatever we think of the Federal Reserve Bank, um, I was never an admirer of Alan Greenspan, I, mainly because I don't trust the person who I can't understand. I don't have a PhD in finance, but I'm I not. I didn't understand him either, and he did it on purpose. He later <laughs> admitted to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, 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 I, I, thought, I thought the guy was, a, was a, a tremendous fraud. I mean, as a showman, a wonderful showman. But um, I don't see the Fed going away tomorrow. Um, and as much as you'd like it, no, it's, not. I, it it's not. And uh, my my less than heartfelt argument for smarter regulation of Wall Street um, rests on, on my assumption that um, when, well, I'll, I'll, I'll relate it to my life. When, when the economic hazard hit in 9-12, the Boston, everyone knows newspaper business is not in great shape. The Phoenix, through a little wit and through being smaller and able to maneuver, we were skating a little bit ahead of the rest of the business. And we were doing not great, but okay. Within six months of the big crash, the big crash hit us. And, you know, I took a 10% pay cut. People who made less in the company took smaller pay cuts but you know 912 hit home in a very real way to me we live in a society so complex that um intricate financial arrangements um no matter how well intentioned if they go wrong can boomerang and whack out the innocent bystanders I don't think regulation is the answer to everything, but I do think it's something we have to be smarter about. Anyway, that was my little. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Jerry Berwick. Uh, John, I have a, a question for you. I mean, I agree with you that people will act in their self-interest, and I think that's a good thing. But yet, Moody's and the other rating agencies rated these toxic, crappy mortgages, AAA, and Ford Motor Credit is given a triple C rating. And I think what, from what I understand is that uh, when the derivatives were being marketed, you know, they would go around to get a, to get a triple A rating, or these mortgages would be marketed for a triple A rating. And if one rating agency wouldn't give them a triple A, they'd shop it, the banks and investment bankers would go and shop it for another agency that would finally give it to them. So then they all played the game. I want to know why. The, tr the agencies themselves are not held accountable for what they have done, and why shouldn't they, and why the, do you feel that there should be some form of regulation on the agency saying, listen, if you put, if you give something a, 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 a bad rating, and it's it's obvious that you've given it a bad rating, that you will not only be penalized by, uh, corporately, but the individuals involved in this can not only can be personally liable for it and criminally liable for it, because this is something that this is something that is uh, endemic to the uh, income tax system, and it seems to work pretty well. And I think if a person is aware that if he's going to give a bad rate, uh, going to be give a rating that sh that is inappropriate, uh, they would be think very carefully before they uh, give a bad rating. Sure. I, I mean, a number of things. One is I, you can't really do that. I mean, these ra ratings are hard to do. I mean, let's not let's not trivialize the job of the rating agency. This is tough work. Uh, they get it wrong sometimes. Most of the time, they get it right. But you know, and I'll, I'll be very critical of the rating agency in a second. But let's first appreciate the fact <laughs> that what they do is hard, and that as part of business, they're going to be wrong sometimes. 
I think they're systemically wrong. They certainly were systemically wrong about mortgages. But why? As I said, rating agencies are not a market phenomenon. And this goes back, if you really want to understand what happens with the rating agencies, this goes back to ERISA, the, the, the regulations that regulate pension plans and insurance mm -hmm. companies. Yeah. What ERISA said is if you have a pension plan and you're going to invest in bonds, the only kind of bonds you can invest are, are AAA rated bonds. And then it says, but those bonds can only be rated by those agencies that are approved by the SEC. And the SEC will only approve three of them. So here you have an industry that is shielded by regulation from competition, and it's got a customer base that by regulation has to buy their product, right? right. All you have to do in order to fix the rating problem is, and there's actually a proposal in front of Congress to do just that right now, and it actually one of the, the amendment passed. I don't think it'll make it in reconciliation between the House and the Senate, but it did pass. And that is all you have to do is get the government out of the business of the rating agencies. That is, don't force pension insurance companies to buy AAA, allow them to make their own judgment about what they buy, and allow competition. Eliminate the SEC's stamp of approval on only three rating agencies. If you had competition and one of the rating agencies systematically got it wrong, what do you think would happen to it? They'd go out of business. The employees would lose their jobs and they'd go out of business. Other rating agencies who got it right would gain business. That's how markets work. That's the beauty of it. The other aspect of this that I want to, another element of why mortgage-backed securities got triple A rated is, is we have to think back to the political atmosphere in 2003, 2004, and this is, this is true of the Bush administration. Bush gave a famous talk in Atlanta in 2003 where he talked about home ownership and the need for home ownership and more people need homes. And this is a big thing for Bush. And Bonnie Frank in, in the House and, and, and uh, Chris Dodd and, and many others in, in Congress were pushing. Freddie and Fannie, Freddie and Fannie, they're great. Housing, housing, housing. This was a big initiative for both parties. Imagine if Freddie and Fannie in 2003 or 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 had said, you know, all these mortgage-backed securities that Freddie and Fannie and all these other banks are putting out, they're not AAA, they're C. You know what kind of political, you know, backlash they would have suffered? They would have come, uh, what kind of heat they would have come, uh, you know, they, they would have been driven out of business because it's a business that's approved by politicians, by the SEC. They had strong political incentive to stamp these things AAA, AAA, AAA. Now, there are other reasons why they were AAA. For example, if you look at housing history, and they use, they use these simple algorithms because that's what the regulators understand, so they use them. And, the, and the, the simple algorithms use historical data, and based on historical data, housing prices never go down. And therefore, they were AAA. Well, I don't know. That was, but that, but that, that really was the whole uh, ma major part of the problem. Well, but thank that, you. it's government. AAA. It's government. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next question. Thank you. Uh, did you want to comment on any of that? No, I agree with a lot of that. <laughs> I, I'll make one one point. The, the, in addition to, um, in a way, the gentleman who asked that question touched on a. a I hate to keep saying a very complicated, there is an oligarchy in the United States, the intersection of where Wall Street, what I'm generally calling, you know, uh, big finance and government intersects, and the rating agencies is one of them. And um, uh, it, it's intellectually very corrupt. Um, the corporations they service are part of that same corruption, as is the government. I mean, this is something right out of Dostoevsky. And I'm, I'm, um, I do think that uh, perhaps the only solution here is more competition. I mean, no one, no smart investment manager on Wall Street is really paying a hell of a lot of attention to those ratings. That's for the rest of us schmucks out here. I mean, it's it's really true. You, you know, those people do their own due diligence. You know, that's why you can go to. Uh, you, you know, a good bookstore, and and still take out the book that war buy the book that Warren Buffett bought. The rating agencies exist for the schmucks like us, and it's as simple as that. And it's you know. for our pensions. That's what yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, my name's Bob O'Connell, and uh, it was sort of glossed over, but the fact that uh, during the Iraqi war, there were no uh, tax increases. Boy, that sounds nice, except what happened to the old principles of guns and butter? You can't have a war, and you can't have a lot of uh, domestic spending. And the idea that there was no uh, tax increase, I think, is ludicrous I as, as to why it was. I mean, somebody comes in with a, with a surplus budget and luckily never had to have an increase when the wall was going on. Well, it's, it doesn't make sense because we have to pay for the, for the war. And as far as well, the... You pay for the war either way, right? If the tax increases, you're paying for the war as well. The, the question is, do you want to pay for the war now or do you want to pay for the war later? But there is an alternative. You know, we always think of... Not have we, a war. Uh, <laughs> could I get, oh, there's one alternative of not having a war. Could I get to the other part, though? Yeah. Which very, is very quickly, because we do have a lot the, of... The, the, the uh, federal deficit. How can you not have a tax increase, have a war, and increase the deficit to... Higher than ever before. Well, and as far as the president going on television and saying, go out there and spend <laughs> so that we can have a good, strong thank, economy thank and you're you not very spending much. enough. I mean, let's face it. Yeah. Who's the leadership? But this is, this, is, this is, I find this really interesting because this is a mindset. The only alternative is to spending going on a war, which, you know, put aside whether it's legitimate or not, but sometimes you have to go to a war. Oh, no, I, I agree. I whether whether you walk was guy. right or not is not the time to debate, but sometimes you have to go to war. The only alternative to funding that war is tax increases. Well, there's another alternative. And now the, the only alternative to reducing deficits is tax increases. Well, there's another alternative. And that's to spend less elsewhere. That is, if you're going to go to war, <laughs> cut programs. Cut programs. If, if we have a deficit right now, Instead of, you know what the real economic stimulus would have been? Take a trillion dollars out of government spending. That would have really stimulated this economy. So, you know, we, should, we need to refocus the, 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 the debate about, about how, you, how you cover these things. Taxes is not the only option. I think it's a horrible option. The, the better option is to reduce the size of government and to limit its scope of activities. Peter? Well, in theory, that's true. Listen, the whole idea, though, of, um, uh, f you know, forcing the government to financial brinksmanship was one of the, the godfathers, if you will, of that thinking was Robert Bartley, for many years, the editor of the Wall Street Journal. In a not widely read publication, The National Interest, about a year, 18 months ago, he did a in a footnote, but nevertheless, he had his mayor culpa saying, geez, that just didn't work. Um, theoretically, we, we could reduce the size of government. I'll tell you this, England's going to find this out in the next couple of years. We're going to find this out in the next couple of years. The amounts of money we all owe, whatever we think about the defense budget, whatever we think about the health care budget to come, which I don't think anyone has any idea how expensive this is going to be. Um, we're going to get reduced governments, and none of us are going to like it. Um, but, but, but I think the answer to that gentleman's question is, is that Americans, all of us, or many of us, have become intellectually sloppy. We think we can have it all, and we just can't. Look, in, in sort of simple terms, if you're gonna, a war worth fighting is a war worth paying for. I happen to think the war in, in Afghanistan was a war worth fighting. I think the war in Iraq, horrible person that Saddam Hussein was, was a massive mistake. Um, and I think we're gonna find that when we pull out, when we declare victory and when we pull out, we're gonna find that it was all for naught. But anyway. Next question. Worse than not. No. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Flaster. My question is primarily for Iran. You mentioned panic before, and also both of you have been speaking about the possibility that we'll be seeing another depression. My question for you is, are you panicked? I have, 
I have a bunch of a diversified portfolio in my IRA, which I won't have access for for 20 years. <laughs> I held on to it when the crash hit in 2008. It pretty much recovered. Now I'm looking at the Dow and I'm saying, oh, here we go again. <laughs> Or I, you know, I, I hate to panic. still hold on and hope for the best. I, there are days when I'm panicked. Uh, look, yeah. and, and this goes to something Peter just said. Uh, the, unfunded, the unfunded liabilities of the United States government, i.e. Uh, us, um, over the next 75 years for Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, according to the U.S. government, and therefore these numbers are dramatically understated. <laughs> no, they are. They are, because they've been wrong and they've been understated every time they mention these. And if you look at the assumptions, the assumptions just unrealistic, $103 trillion. Um, that does not include the new health care bill, which will cost trillions to fund. That does not include the fact that every pension plan in the United States, particularly the public pension plans, are all underfunded to the tune of several, several trillion dollars. And the government is a guarantor of all those. It has so-called insurance fund. Um, I mean, you just start doing the math. And you could tax everybody at 90 percent and assume they all continued working, and you still can't pay for it. Um, it you know, it, it is, we are heading, I like, <laughs> this is the analogy, some of you have heard this analogy because I use it a lot these days. We're on, I believe, we're on a raft, on a river, heading towards a waterfall. That waterfall is this massive depression or whatever it's going to be. And the 300 million people on this raft, and we're all rowing with the current. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> maybe, maybe Republicans have little holes in their paddles and they roll a little slowly, maybe. And maybe Democrats have bigger paddles. It doesn't matter. We're all rolling with the current. And th that's just the economics uh, of it. And I, I agree with Peter. I think we've seen a decline in the, in the quality of thinking in this country. I've seen a decline in the horizon in which people think. Uh, I happen to think that government is a big part of the reason for that. And, and if I may, I'm going to answer something Peter said that I haven't had a chance to ask. Why is what's happening in the Gulf of Mexico happening? Why is the mine stuff happening? I believe that a big part of it is that, and I think, I think we see it in the way we behave towards our banking, the big part of it is that we are being dumbed down and corporations are dumbed down and people are dumbed down by government regulations and by, you know, we, we, we're... You know, big brother's watching. They're taking care of it. Don't worry. Be happy. You don't, have to, you don't have to inspect the elevator. Some bureaucrat has already done it for you. Don't think about these things. I think there's a lot of that going on. I know when I put money into my bank, I don't care if it's solvent or not because there's deposit insurance. You know, big deal. If I'm a mine operator, as long as I get that check mark off from the regulator, even if there's an accident, I'm going to blame the regulator. I'm off the hook. It, you know, and it goes on and on and on. No responsibility. Too big to fail. It's all throughout our, throughout our, our lives. We are taking less and less responsibility for ourselves. So there are days when I'm panicked. There's a, there's a lot of energy behind change, real change, not Obama's change, um, <laughs> which I'm positive about. But look, once you start projecting 10, 20 years onto the future, things look bleak unless you start turning the raft in the other direction. And you have to make your own estimation when that happens and, and whether it happens in terms of investing. Peter? Yeah, well, let me focus on health care for a second. I love the idea of national health care for everyone in theory. To me, one of the great – here's what's crazy about the idea. National health care insurance was invented by Otto von Bismarck a German who was far more influential in his time. He was, in a way, the first socialist. Marx came up with the ideas, but Bismarck implemented them. Let's jump ahead. You have an essentially 19th century idea to promote social stability because things were so unstable with health insurance, with unemployment insurance, with pensions, all things that we take for granted now. We didn't have health insurance in the United States. Europe has it. Those unfunded liabilities are among the things contributing to the coming bankruptcy in Europe. So what's the United States do? You know, we go and we adopt a system, a failing system, after it's already gone out of date. <laughs> Why did we do it? Because the American labor movement made it a top priority for endorsing Obama. Um, 
to me, the corruption, the intellectual corruption here is no attempt was even made with something like, say, Social Security to say, this would have been much more palatable for me if someone said, look, we're all, by the way, what I'm about to say wouldn't solve the numbers problem, but at least it would make some intellectual sense to say, all right, we're going to all have in national health insurance, and you know what? We are all going to pay something for it. The debate was, at what point do you start charging people? You know, who don't you charge? You know, again, let's, we have it now. We're going to live with the consequences. The consequences are going to be much more complicated and I believe much nastier than most people think. But in putting the program together, we didn't even make a stab at trying to get everyone to contribute to it. T to me, th that sort of shows the folly of this thinking. Um, you know, in a way, it's a, a form of something for nothing. You know, well, if you need a heart transplant, why does a $5 copay matter? Well, it matters because you stop and think that this isn't a free service. Um, you know, I don't see anything wrong with someone making $30,000 a year with two kids, which is basically just above the poverty level. I don't see anything wrong with them making, even if it's a token payment to such health insurance. We live in La La Land. Thank you. So we have about 10, just on, you know, 10 to 15 minutes left here. And I, there are some people standing. So if you could, when you ask a question, make sure to get it quick. And I'll ask the speakers to, Odd. yeah, I know. <laughs> but if we could just try to get through the rest of the, uh, the questions. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill McDermott. Um, Mr. Kanzig, you mentioned earlier that you thought the Bush administration was part of deregulation. Um, and maybe a pro-business uh, administration. Can you give specific evidence? Well, where listen, the Bush I'm just as hard on the Clinton administration. Oh, uh, I'm just speaking specifically of the Bush administration. And also, uh, Dr. Brook, if uh, you said that the Bush administration wasn't pro-business, uh, could you give maybe an explanation as to why most people think they are? Um, thank you very much. Well, I'll, I'll give a quick example. Look, um, uh, the, the, the way Cheney, um, I'll use the word, hijacked energy policy behind closed doors. Um, by the way, it's the same thing that Hillary Clinton tried to do unsuccessfully with health care policy. Um, you know, my take towards government officials is I'm pretty much an equal opportunities basher. Um, it's not so much in the issue of regulation that I think it's going to make a difference. I basically see some pretty dire days ahead, and I'm hoping that a little smart regulation might soften the blow. I think Jan is saying that less regulation might soften the blow. We both seem to agree that things are pretty messed up, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, there are plenty of examples where I think Bush increased regulations of business, subbings actually being the dramatic one. But why? Because I think that Bush was, was communicated a particular message. He presented himself as this pro-markets capitalist, but it was a crony I call it crony socialism because I don't think there's such a thing as crony capitalism. It was a crony socialism. And that, the Bush, the, the Cheney energy thing, I mean, government shouldn't have energy policy. I mean, what a concept. The government shouldn't be in the business of energy. Let people go out there, find energy, and provide it in a market setting, buy, sell. Why should the government give subsidies or tax any particular form of energy one way or another? Let the market deal with it. It shouldn't have health policy. The government just shouldn't be involved. It shouldn't have banking policy. It shouldn't have housing policy. Whenever it has such a policy, it messes it up, and it has to. It always will. So there is no such thing, in my view, as smart regulation. It, it just doesn't exist. Next question. Okay, this actually goes to uh, what Yoram was just saying. Um, so if I understood the arguments before, both of you were agreeing that the problems were in are a result of bad regulation. Uh, you disagree about what the what was bad about it. But uh, Peter's view is that we need smarter regulation going forward, and Yaron's view is that we need to get rid of regulations. So my question is, what is regulation, as opposed to just laws? Because you both, I'm sure, agree that we should have laws. So uh, what is regulation such that we should be getting rid of it? 
I, I think that the difference is that, um, you know, legitimate, legitimate laws are laws that deal with crimes, that deal with a victim, that deal with the issue of force in some way or another. They deal with fraud or force. So, so they are laws against theft. There are laws against fraud. And fraud can be complicated. So you need a variety of different laws in order to regulate. There are laws that protect property rights against various types of theft, intellectual property rights, and so on. So laws relate to crimes that have to do with theft or, or bodily harm or, or some violation of rights, some restri somebody restricting your freedoms. Um, I think regulations, as I try to say, affect directly the voluntary transactions between people engaged in the marketplace, where force is not a characteristic. So uh, I, want to, um, I want to drill an oil well on my land. It's my land. It's my property. Why shouldn't I just be able to bring a rig and drill, I'm assuming I'm not harming anybody else's land around me and so on? Yet there are a million regulations dictating what kind of equipment I can use and, uh, and so on that have nothing to do with just property protection, but it have to do with wanting to determine how I use my property or how I engage in business with other people. Um, so I think that's, that would be the differentiation. And I think those, the government has no role in those. You know, if it's voluntary, if it's not violating anybody's rights, the government should just stay away. Peter? <sighs> I'll say in spirit I agree with – I certainly agree with Jan's definition. Um, but l let's take his example of drilling on land. I'd have, a harder t I'd have a hard time generally arguing with that. And he didn't make it, but I will. Drilling out at sea, however, it's a different situation. Let me skip from the question in, in a, a thought that just occurred to me. One thing that's very interesting here is that the massive infusion of foreign capital into the United States years ago stopped going into our financial markets. And that's because I think the Japanese and the Chinese are smarter than American investors. And they know that those markets are rigged. That money was going into government debt. Now, of course, the government debt itself is, is being devalued as the, our underlying economy is corrupted, and that's where a problem is going to come from. But um, anyway, that's just a random thought that I wanted to get out there. Next question. Thanks. My name is Roger Zimmerman. I'm a scientist, and uh, when we uh, hear people make what seem to be quantitative statements, you know, we like to see if they can provide numbers that back those up. And it seems that, <laughs> it seems that uh, you know, the premise on which your argument is based, Peter, is the notion that the amount of regulation, or a premise, sorry, actually decreased from 1978 when uh, the, Carter the Carter administration started to regulate. Is, isn't there a piece of evidence that could support? Could could you show me like some no no that by the way that, some that, document that, that that's got a, smaller? That's a fair assumption to make. That that really isn't, and you're forcing me to to think about it in a way I hadn't before. My hunch is that regulation just kept going. Why? Because the government keeps putting out papers. The income tax, my income tax form has not gotten simpler. Based on that, I assume the regulation has it. No, what I'm saying is that the world has become, the financial world has become infinitely more complex and creative in that regulation um, was not able to keep up with it. Um, I, I'd try to keep it as simple as that. And when there, in a, when there were a, a, a few cases, for example, uh, like Boxley Bourne, who tried to, let's just say, level a playing field. That's not the most accurate way. But they were squashed by, you know, the, the, the neoliberals. You know, frankly, I think neoliberal economic thinking um, is probably far more dangerous than... Um, uh, classic conservative thinking. I, I'm taking a swerve here. But think of it this way. The same people that brought you 
financial derivatives uh, trying to bring us cap and trade agreements. You, you know, it, it, it's it's a neoliberal con job. Um, can I just make a quick comment about complexity? I would actually argue, and, and uh, I used to, no. in, in my days in finance, I used to actually do this, that one of the reasons things become so complex is because of regulation. That is, because there's so much regulation in the financial industry, the banks spend an enormous amount of money and talent and brain power to try to get around those regulations, which they should because they're trying to make money. And much of the complexity that exists in the, in the international financial market is a consequence of, of uh, instruments and mechanisms to get around regulations that shouldn't exist. And you could even argue that credit default swaps are a mechanism to buy insurance that the insurance industry is not allowed to provide because of regulations, so, and, and it's needed. The fact is credit default swap, something that does something like credit default swap is needed out there. They came up with derivatives, complex derivatives, because that was the best, in this regulatory environment, that was the best way to do it. The fewer regulations you have, I think the less complexity you get in financial markets, at least in this type, this type of systemic complexity, because I think much of it is to get around the regulations. Folks, so, it's 8.03 right now. Just want to let you know we're going to answer these last couple of questions, and you'll be out of here in just a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Vitaly Vashkevich. I'm a student. Um, question to Peter Kadzis, please. Uh, by the same reasoning as you claim that, and you mentioned um, oil, Gulf, Gulf oil spill a few times, uh, do you th and you claim it happened due to the lack of the government's regulation, do you think the greatest technological catastrophe in the hu human history, which happened in 1986 in USSR, Chernobyl, explosion in the nuclear plant, do you think it happened due to the lack of government regulation? Does it happen to oh, at no. a Let's state see. nuclear plant? <laughs> and I, do you think I, 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 eruption? I have nothing but contempt for the Soviet Union. And I, think, I really think, I, I think the intellectual basis for the question is just it, it, it's a cute line and it got a great laugh, but you know the 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 Soviet Union is one of the original rogue states. Um, I think the basis for comparison is totally without merit. Okay, um, another another question, another. Very, uh, we 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 have some other people. So if okay. if it's very quick, but otherwise we really have to move on. Okay, it was a rhetorical question. Oh, right. Okay, that's. <laughs> Mr. Kansas, when I came here, I expected to hear, a, to hear a very strong denunciation of Mr. Brooks' Randian view of things, and I'm very, pleasing, uh, very pleased to hear your kind of not-so-radical Boston Phoenix-type view. I can't imagine the Phoenix editorializing with, with a lack of passion that you've displayed here today. Are you willing to say that Mr. Brooks view of things, if his vision were put into place, would not be disastrous, that it's, his vision is worth looking, t t uh, taking a look at? Mr. Brooks's vision and my vision have no more chance of being put into play. <laughs> if they were. That's if the question. Were. Well, no, because I, I think both of us are coming from it very different points of view. Um, it's a very good question. Um, but... but I think, unfortunately, unfortunately for us, we both have a, a, a are very worried about the future. Um, I don't think there's much that either of us is saying is going to make much difference as to what's coming. I think, unfortunately, we're here speaking in a very theoretical realm that the the mistakes, whether they're, by the way, some well-intentioned mistakes, human beings make mistakes, um, but there's a compounding effect, and we really have at least 30 years of um, sloppy thinking that my kids are going to be paying for anyway. Let, let me disagree with Peter on one little thing. Um, <laughs> Finally. I have every intention of making a difference. <laughs> I might be wrong.
Well, listen. I hope. I hope you're right. Well, I'm, to, to Peter's. I hope to Peter's right. defense. Hope <laughs> to Peter's defense, I'll tell you that he does try to make right. a difference. Does that well, do what? You do try to make a difference. Fast question. Fortunately, uh, the SEC recently uh, filed suit against Goldman Sachs, and I'm curious about uh, both panelists. Your comment on that? Uh, does it rise to the level of fraud? Uh, their accusations. Um, and if they don't, do you think that Goldman Sachs did anything unethical? Oh, unethical, yes. Illegal, I'm not so sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure that they've broken the law. Um, do I hope the guys burn in hell? You bet I do. But I'm not sure they, I'm not sure we can legally send them to jail. So finally, we're going to disagree. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if they broke the law, but I don't see any ethical problem with what they did. Uh, <laughs> and, and this is why. Um, this is not the case, uh, you know, this is not the case that Goldman called up their clients and said, look, we've got a great instrument here to sell you. You should buy it. We're buying it. We think this is going to go through the roof. If they had done that and at the same time were shorting it, I agree completely, unethical, yeah. bad behavior. This is a case in which the client came to them and said, look, we want to bet on housing prices continuing to go up, basically, and mortgages continuing to pay. We want to bet on that. And the instrument that Morgan, that uh, Goldman Sachs actually put together is more complex than, uh, than uh, credit default swaps. Yeah. Uh, it's, because it's, it's, uh, it's not, they weren't actually mortgages. Yeah, they were synthetic little. mortgages. Yeah. It gets really complicated. So the client came to them and said, we want to put this together. We believe mortgage prices are going up. And mortgage said, and Goldman Sachs says, this is exactly what we're here for. Sure, we'll, put it, we'll help you put it together. Um, and they did. And indeed, not only did they do that, but Goldman Sachs actually kept a piece of this product for themselves, so they lost money on it. Now, they had another client who came to them and said, you know, and this is, this is the famous Paulson, who said, uh, I want to take the other side of these kinds of instruments, this one, but others as well, because I believe mortgage prices are going to go down. Can you facilitate that? And Goldman Sachs said, sure, you know, we're just a middleman here. And they let him short this particular instrument. This particular instrument did no better or no worse than any other instrument like it. So they, this idea that Paulson actually chose the worst mortgages to put in into it is ludicrous because it, was just, it just did average like everybody else, which means really, really bad. But, but they all did really, really bad. Um, you know, and they, they were a market maker. They facilitated the long position that one institution wanted and a short position, another institution. Goldman, by the way, overall, lost quite a bit of money on, uh, on uh, mortgage-backed securities. One of their divisions made some money because they were smart enough to short, but the, the, the mothership, if you will, lost quite a bit of money. You know, I just don't see what the big deal here. This is the kind of transaction that happens literally every single day on plain vanilla, plain vanilla stuff, but here it's complicated and sophisticated, so you know, it's presented as some big fraudulent or unethical behavior. Market makers do this every day. There's nothing unique here. So before I turn it over to Jen to officially close the program, will you please join me in thanking these two gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs>